What do you think when you see religious people, when you see popes or rabbis or people who fervently believe, the Billy Grahams mm -hmm. of the world, who are sincere and wonderful people? Yeah, of course. Who actually may be delusional that they're going somewhere? No, they're, they're, they're embedded in belief systems. And what I look at is I see all the belief systems, and when you line them up, they're not really compatible with one another. So whatever they're believing, it can't be a truth that applies to everybody because other people believe what they do with no less fervor. And so I sit back and as a person who's interested in, in objective truths and I say, well, it doesn't look like that's a path towards an objective truth. Science is not in, in principle committed to the idea that there's no afterlife or that the, the mind is identical to the brain right. or that materialism is true. Science is completely open to whatever in fact is true. And if it's true that the consciousness is being run like software on the brain and can, by virtue of ectoplasm or something else we don't understand can be dissociated from the brain at death, that would be part of our growing scientific understanding of the world if we could discover it. Now, uh, and there's, there are ways we could in fact discover that if it were true. The problem is there are very good reasons to think it's not true. And we know this from now 150 years of neurology where you damage areas of the brain and faculties are lost. And they're clearly, it's not that everyone with brain damage is perf has their soul perfectly intact. They just can't get the words out. This is the, you, everything about your mind can be damaged by damaging the brain. You can cease to recognize faces. You can cease to know the names of animals, but you still know the names of tools. I mean, the, 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 the fragmentation in, in, in the way in which our, our mind is parcelated at the level of the brain is not at all intuitive, and, had, and there's a lot known about it. And what we're being asked to consider is that you damage one part of the brain and the mind, something about the mind and, and, and subjectivity is lost. You damage another and, and, and yet more is lost. And yet if you damage the whole thing at death, we can rise off the brain with all our faculties intact, recognizing grandma and speaking English. And, and I think a much more important point is if everything you're saying about your religious orientation is true, because you're, you're basically confessing a kind of scientific attitude toward the mysteries of subjectivity and, and what happens after death, then the usefulness of holding to these traditions and these first century books is, is uh, I'm completely at a loss. I mean, it seems like you're in the wrong line of work. You should yeah. be psychology. <laughs> We're living in a world in which nine million children every year die before they reach the age of five. Okay, year after year after year. I mean, that is, that is a, uh, an Asian-style tsunami of the sort you remember from 2004, every 10 days, killing only children before the age of five. I mean, think about these children, think about their parents, know that virtually all of these parents are people who believe in God and were praying all the while that their children would be saved, and their prayers were not answered. Now, the afterlife is, comes into the midst of this reality uh, and as a promise that all of this is going to make sense in the end, that somehow at the end of existence, we are going to be all let in on the, the punchline and have a, a, a mighty laugh with Almighty God for eternity. Now, there's no evidence of that. And I, and I think, therefore, that this concept of the afterlife really functions as a, as a substitute for wisdom. It, it functions as a substitute for, for really absorbing our predicament, which is that everyone is going to die. There are circumstances that are just catastrophically unfair. Uh, and the only justice we're going to find in the world is the, is the justice we make. And I think we, need, we have an ethical responsibility to, to absorb this really down to the soles of our feet. And, and this notion of an afterlife, the, the happy talk about how it's all going to work out and it's all part of God's plan is, is a way of shirking that responsibility. But it's those of us who doubt the supernatural who have the failure of imagination. And good move.
but, but there's no one who can't play this game. There could be an afterlife and no God. Why not? There could be many gods and no afterlife. <laughs> there could be a god with a sense of humor where good people went to hell and, and evil people. <laughs> and, evil people ca and evil people carried on as in his initial creation, ruling the roost. I can imagine quite a lot too, but here's what, I, here's what we're meant to discuss, I think. Those who have claimed to know in advance the rules of reward and punishment and the actual details of the afterlife, people who actually have and continue to rule the mental lives of millions of people, who have to explain away things, like Sam's nine million dead children, by saying, well, what happens to their souls? St. Augustine has to come up with an answer. He says, they go to limbo. At least if they're not baptized Catholic, that's where they go. So millions of people for hundreds of years thought that's where their children were. A terrible form of sadism and mental serfdom that the church is now considering um, dropping. But that limbo was really real to people when it was imagined for them uh, by a sadistic uh, North African pseudo-intellectual. <laughs> so that, it's not a failure of imagination to say that, that this use of imagination is, is perverse. Uh, neither Sam nor I have said it's impossible that there be a post-life existence. We've just said that it's not knowable, not that it's not known. So surely the default position must be that it's those who have ever said that resurrection or an afterlife is a dogma who have the explaining to do. Uh, for myself, I'm perfect. I, I'm very open to that. I like surprises. <laughs> belief in the afterlife, or at least a profession of belief in the afterlife, gives you something to say at the most, at the, in the most difficult moments in life to others who are losing someone or who have lost someone. It gives you something to say that, that, an, that an atheist doesn't have, which if believed by the one who has just lost their child, for instance, is really consoling. I mean, there is nothing better in terms of consolation than to believe that the, that the, the child you just lost is now someplace perfect and you will be reunited. Sam, what would you say? I mean, put well, yourself well, on the spot. I, I, if somebody, I asked, if somebody in that moment asked you, I'm, I'm, I'm about to die, what's going to happen to me? What would you tell well, them? Well, I mean, I think actually this, this issue of, of the one who dies is less... Our, our fear of death, at least as far as I can tell from a sample of one, is not of our own death. We, we all go to sleep every night and just disappear. We lose everything. I mean, deep sleep for, for, for almost everyone is synonymous with oblivion. I mean, you lose, you lose your sensory experience, you forget your life. If you never woke up, you wouldn't notice it. And this is, many people have noticed this, the, the, perhaps most famously the Roman poet Lucretius. If death is synonymous with, with non-existence, there really is nothing to fear. And slipping into it may feel just as satisfying as slipping into sleep. I mean, it's just no, that's, that's not what we're worried about. We're wor worried about the process of dying, perhaps, I mean, the, the process of being ill and in pain. And we're really worried about losing the people we love while we're alive. The fact that life is short and that it's gonna end makes it more valuable. We give, we give greater value to things that are rare, don't we? precious metals, precious things. If things are really rare, you can get a big price for it. I just, I was looking for a 1943 copper penny and I thought I had one, I would get like $100,000 for it because it's so rare. When things are plentiful, their value goes down. So if life is eternal, then life is cheap. If it lasts forever and it never ever ends, then it doesn't have any real value that we would call precious. The fact that we face, like you say, we face the reality of the coldness and the uncaring universe that we live in, face it with bravery and with honesty and say, I'm going to die someday. That's going to be it. That actually gives your life more value now as you live it because you're not sacrificing anything for some future rewards. You're living this life now. Of course, none of us are going to know after we're dead, we're dead. And of course, death is the cessation of a physical biological organism. So I think most atheists who have that attitude actually value life more 
than someone like Trent does because Trent thinks there's going to be this afterlife where everything's going to make everything right. We don't. We got to get it right now. We got to do things now while we're alive and then maybe have some consolation in the fact that our descendants or future generations will benefit from some of the good that we do now. Ultimately, it's all going to be, it's all going to go away. Ultimately, it is cosmically meaningless, but that doesn't mean it is not immediately immensely meaningful to us right now as we live our lives.